Good evening, everybody, and thanks so much for coming here to the New America Foundation. Um, my name is Kevin Carey. I direct the education um, policy program here. Um, and um, we're uh, lucky enough to be joined today by Jamel Bowie, staff writer at uh, Slate Magazine. That's correct. Um, and of course, um, Dana Goldstein, New York Times bestselling author, Dana Goldstein. Am I the first one who gets to introduce you that way? Very good. <laughs> it won't get old, I don't imagine. Um, the author of The Teacher Wars, which is a tremendous work of education history. Um, Dana wrote The Teacher Wars on a Bernard Schwartz Fellowship uh, here at the New America Foundation, so we could not be more pleased to have her here today uh, to talk about the many, many things uh, in her book. So. Um, we're going to start uh, with the conversation, and then we will have time for questions from the audience um, probably around 6 o'clock. And also, please help yourself to um, the bar and back and the uh, refreshments outside. Um, so Dana, you, uh, your book begins um, much closer to the beginning of the United States of America than the end. And in the first chapter, um, there's a character named Catherine Beecher, who was um, in the middle of a lot of interesting things related to Harriet Beecher Stowe, friend of Horace Mann, the founder of the American Common Schools Movement. Um, I, I found myself as a reader wanting to like Catherine Beecher quite a bit. Um, she was uh, very smart, very independent. Um, she was, in her own way, a you know, very uh, important contributor to the idea of uh, public education as we know it in America today. And she was also uh, very interested in advancing the cause of women, particularly in, in giving them access to um, opportunities to teach. Um, but in reading your book, at the same time, I kind of feel like I shouldn't be such a Catherine Beecher fan. I think you seem to be making the argument um, that in some of the bargains that were made with local officials around how we fund education, um, in the way that we chose to create institutions to train teachers, and sort of more broadly in our notion of the intersection between femininity and the teaching profession that um, American education is still sort of haunted by Catherine Beecher's spirit. Is that, t talk to us about that. That is so accurate. Um, <laughs> I think you read my intention exactly correctly. Uh, because I started out myself wanting to like her and I struggled with her as a person. Um, so she grows up, she's the daughter of Lyman Beecher, who is a famous Calvinist fire and brimstone celebrity preacher. And she is the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she's engaged to a very interesting young man who dies in a shipwreck and drowns. And she's about 21. She realizes that she's never going to marry herself. And she's a very intelligent, intellectual woman. And she wants to do something useful with her life. And she settles on education and teaching in particular as the thing that she will do that is useful. And she makes a sort of very um, compelling plea for the role of the teacher in establishing this new American Republic, which of course in the 1820s and 1830s is very much still an experiment. And I think it's hard for us today to get our minds around what it was like to be a young American in the, in the 1820s and 1830s. But um, this idea of going west was um, an imperative. And she wanted women to be part of that project. And she defined the teaching role as how they would do it. They would go west and open these one-room schoolhouses. Yet at the same time, in her efforts to make this vision appealing to policymakers, who of course did not want to raise taxes to fund public education, she makes the argument that one of the reasons why women should teach is that they can be paid half as much. It's not the most compelling argument to her personally. <laughs> she personally wants to do it because it's interesting and because she wants to play a role in public life. But she's pragmatic, and so she makes this pragmatic argument to budget cutting. Um, and I call it in the book the argument for cheapness, which is constantly a part of our education debate. We are attracted to certain ideas because they're perceived as being inexpensive. Um, so she is a very tough figure. and, and you look at her, she also opposes women's suffrage. So teaching for her is a traditionally feminine job. It is, it is mothering outside the home. She sees the school as an extension of the home in that it's where women lead children. So just as the mother leads children in the home, the teacher leads children in the school. And normal schools are established to train these mother teachers, is the phrase that I use in the book, and they are, in many places, open only to women. 
So if the state of Massachusetts creates a normal school and only accepts women into it as trainee teachers, they then end up with a public school system that is only staffed by teachers who they can pay 50% as much. So in this way, teaching goes from 90% female in 1800 to what we have today, 76% female today. And interestingly, these, this, this overwhelming three quarters female nature of American teaching is so surprisingly consistent over time with a, sort of bl a few blips after the Great Depression, during the Great Depression. And we know in our own lifetimes, many of us here, not me, but after, during the Vietnam War. Um, you use a phrase um, throughout the book, and it, it seems like you chose it as kind of a, an intellectual thread that goes throughout your history, which takes us all the way up um, um, to the present day. Um, you used the phrase moral panic. Um, and I, I felt like, to some extent, the, an alternate sub, subhead could have been the history of moral panics and why they screwed things up for American <laughs> yeah. teachers. So wh what does that mean, and what has it meant to teaching? I didn't set out to write about moral panic. It was a concept that sociologists have written about that I was familiar with from before I started this book. Um, but I did start out thinking that teaching is a very politicized profession, the most controversial profession in American public life. We're constantly debating it, tenure, unions, charter schools, ah! Like, so we're, we're constantly fighting on these topics. Um, but one of the surprises in the historical research was that this panic that teaching is a failed profession does go back to the early 19th century. And that kind of triggered my memory of having read about moral panics in other contexts, like welfare queens or crack babies which you know, were the sort of moral panics of the 80s. But with teaching, even if you go back to Catherine Beecher making the argument that women should be teachers in the 1830s, she creates this panic about male teachers. She describes them as drunks, as lash-wielding, almost child abusers. Um, and in describing male teachers in this way, she says, let's send the men into the factories and bring the women into the schools. I mean, you have to remember, think about Lowell. At the time, it was women in the factories, oftentimes. So she's kind of arguing for this flip that we, that we still have you know, today into the 20th century, the conception that the manufacturing economy is for men. Teaching is almost a companion, almost a working class job for women. So that's the first moral panic. And then, of course, we see the red scares in which so many left-wing teachers, tens of thousands across the country, lose their jobs. That's one of the biggest moral panics in the book. And I talk about many others. but. Um, I think today we have this image of the ineffective, older, tenured teacher. I make the argument in the book that through the panic we have about this figure today, you know, we see these echoes of these historical panics. And you talk about the, um, you mentioned the, the Red Scares. Uh, another major theme or uh, subject of your book is the relationship between teaching and organized labor. Um, and you tell the story of how <coughs> in New York City, uh, there was, um, through the post-World War I period and all the way up into the 1960s, um, but maybe reaching its peak sort of around World War II um, and afterwards, um, a group of uh, New York City's teachers who were explicitly um, associated with communism and how uh, that um, led to their sort of um, the separation of their relationship first with the AFL, and then they went to the CIO, and then eventually the you know away from the CIO, um, and then eventually in the 1960s the teachers union was pushed aside by the organization that became the United Federation of Teachers, which was more um, more male, more related to blue collar unionism, and, and you I think actually did a nice job of anchoring that discussion with the earlier. Uh, tensions and choices that were made in Chicago in terms of the relation between teacher unions as organizations and organized labor. Um, and you know, I, I was noteworthy, I think at the end of that chapter, there was, you kind of evoke a sense of loss that, that you felt like something was lost. And so can you tell us a little more about why that is and is it still lost, the thing that yeah. you think? So the teachers union, which is active in New York City from about 1935 to the early 1960s, was um, informally tied to the Communist Party. Not all of the active people in this union were Communist Party members, but they were certainly sympathetic to the Communist agenda. They were very tied to thinkers like W.B. Du Bois and other folks at the time who were um, kind of skirting around this community of Communist intellectuals. Um, the term historians have used to describe the teachers union of the time is that it was social movement unionism. 
they actually opposed the right of teachers to strike. They did not have the right to collectively bargain. So what were they all about? On one hand, they did familiar, they did familiar union things like go to the state legislature and ask for more pay for teachers. But a lot of what they did was um, ally with low-income parents and communities to do things like make sure school bathrooms are clean, to make sure that racist textbooks were taken out of the schools. And they really looked to parents to kind of help them set the agenda and in some ways had a more fruitful relationship um, than we saw teachers unions having with parents in low-income neighborhoods after collective bargaining. Um, interestingly, when Al Schenker and the United Federation of Teachers rise up and um, they go on strike, the teacher union teachers, these communists, they break the picket lines. I mean, that is just fascinating. And then later on in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, in the late 60s and early 70s, the children of these communists break the picket lines. So you see this multi-generation flow of far left teachers who are skeptical of the sort of establishment union movement. Um, these folks, a lot of them had truly radical politics. Like I thumbed through their newspapers and you would see these kind of glowing, ridiculous um, depictions of life in the Soviet Union. Um, so we certainly we don't want to romanticize um, this period, but I think that this was a more, um, it was an extremely intellectually coherent uh, sort of movement driven, neighborhood driven, attuned to poverty type of unionism at the time. Um, and, and to me, it was really interesting. It was an interesting model, potentially. You quote uh, at the end of that chapter one of the, I think, three men who were part of the founding of the UFT is saying, um, teaching high school is like working on an assembly line, mm -hmm. which is the sort of thing that I think uh, is, like nobody would ever say that in Wait, public it's now. It's right? like calling <laughs> so, the people now. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, was that idea just yeah, kind of so worked out or do people just know not to say that? Yeah, so that's George Altamare. He was one of the co-founders of the UFT alongside Al Shanker. I want to give him a little credit because the work rules that teachers had in the 50s were like assembly work rules. Um, you saw that the teachers were not allowed to have lunch on their own or with other adults, that um, they had to supervise all aspects of the functions of the school that had nothing to do with academics, um, things that we have support staff to do today in schools. And if they were going to you know, take a sick day, they had to have a note from a doctor. They were paid $66 per week, which at the same at the time, New York City was the same as a car washer. So you can see why he would have said that at the time. Um, interestingly, he also said it again, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. Um, so, but he was also an excellent social studies teacher. So you kind of have to balance that. Why would a guy like that say something like that? I talk about how these founders of the modern union movement, you know, going back to the early 60s, they were the sons of blue collar workers. So they grew up in households that were infused with this type of language and you know, mostly in New York City Jewish and Italian Catholic households. And so alongside Al Schenker, you know, they, their parents were furriers and seamst unionized seamstress seamstresses and things like that. So that sort of language came very naturally. Um, Jamel, your thoughts and reactions yeah. to the book? Uh, earlier you had, you had mentioned um, W.E.B. Du Bois and one of the interesting things I thought and the book was the extent to which teaching sort of formed the backbone for kind of black intellectual life, beginning really in the immediate post-emancipation period and continuing for really the next century. So I would love it if you could just talk a bit more about that. Yeah. So in chapter three of the book, I talk about the black teachers who came from the North into the South to educate the children and grandchildren of slaves and during the Civil War and right afterward. Um, and Du Bois uses this phrase, the preacher and the teacher. He sees the preacher and the teacher as the epitome of, of black hopes and dreams in these decades after the Civil War in terms of using education to uplift the race, which is the term that is used. And you know, Du Bois himself, during one of his summers at Fisk University, he gets himself certified as a teacher, which takes about two seconds at the time. <laughs> and he, um, he goes out into rural Tennessee, and he's teaching in a one-room schoolhouse it's in the rural black belt. It's inside a Confederate colonel's, um, what was his corn repository. 
so this is like a windowless, dank, like horrible <laughs> place to have a school. And yet, you know, he's doing this, what we would consider today, high expectations, no excuses <laughs> um, type of education with the kids. And he later writes about this, you know, beautifully for the Atlantic, which becomes a big part of the souls of black folk. Um, I also talk about Anna Julia Cooper, who was a teacher and then a principal here at the M Street High School in Washington, D.C. It was also called the Dunbar School, had several name changes. But this school here in D.C. epitomizes Du Bois's hopes for the talented tenth. This idea that 10% of black Americans were destined to go to college and have professional careers. Um, interestingly, in terms of the concept of the moral panic, which Kevin brought in, um, these expectations of high intellectualism for black children ignited a moral panic. Right. And you see Anna Julia Cooper, this path-breaking Washington feminist black educator, driven from her job um, during Teddy Roosevelt's administration for her very strong, um, her very strong belief that M Street High School should not be a vocational school but this should be a school that prepares kids for Oberlin and Brown and Harvard, and she successfully is doing that and is driven from her job. In fact, they concoct a fake sex scandal saying that she had an affair with her foster son. So this is the sort of fascinating um, politicization of, of education that we see throughout history, and um, black teachers who had these high expectations, interestingly, their ideas are very much the basis of today's education reform movement, but at the time they were attacked and vilified for having these beliefs. What's, what's so interesting about the vilification and just that particular historical moment is that, you know, you have um, the panic over Teddy Roosevelt inviting Booker T. Washington to the White House. You have in newspapers all throughout the Northeast um, concerns about educating blacks because and this is... Um, I forget, this is like a newspaper from Mississippi, uh, but he's writing in, in about, about the Northeast, and he says, listen, if we educate them, they'll become even more criminal. Mm. Um, which is hilarious to think, you know, given a lot of rich stereotypes today, I was like the reverse. Um, and so yeah, just, just that, your, your, your focus on that was, um, was, I don't know, really great, given what what was going on in the broader American mm -hmm. culture, and it it often seems like, um, particularly with you know African American teachers and Black communities, that what is happening in their classrooms and their schools is in some way, shape, or form a reflection of sort of broader racial narratives happening at the time. I think that's right, and I want to talk about the issue of school discipline because it's. Um, it has, the racial disparity in school discipline over the past year has become more and more of a news story, in part because the Obama administration was very wise to disseminate some of the data that they have collected showing these disparities. One of the surprises to me in the research was the extent to which debates over how to discipline children are not only eternal, but have always had this racialized cast. So in 1897, when the very first teachers' union is founded in Chicago, one of the rights that the female 97% white teachers are asking for is the right to toss kids from the classroom. Now at the time this had more of an ethnic than a racial cast. It was, they were specifically asking for this for immigrant kids. A lot of these kids had been working in factories and then they you know, made truancy laws stricter so they brought these factory kids into the classroom and guess what? They had no idea how to sit still and be part of a learning environment and the teachers were saying I, I have a 60 person class, very typical at the time. I've got to be able to throw the bad kids out or I can't teach. So, so this motivated, in many ways, the founding of teachers' unions. And in 1967, big teacher strike in New York City. Again, the two-thirds white teaching force is asking for the right to, to, to toss kids from the classroom. And at this time, it begins to take on a very racialized cast because the kids that are getting tossed out are, are black and Puerto Rican at the time. And this becomes a big part of the black bearer community control debate with folks saying, like, take a look at what's happening. We can't say anymore this is not about race. There's a, uh, a neat moment um, where Anna Cooper, who was primarily featured as a person existing in the 19th century and early 20th century, shows up in 1954 yeah. at age 100 yeah. um, <laughs> to say of the Brown v. Board decision, I don't like it. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about desegregation and its effect on education. And you have, I think, 
some really interesting thoughts and discussions about the effect of desegregation on uh, black teachers, some of which was, I think, like much of which was um, the result of racist policies of all kinds, but perhaps not all of it. Um, and and I'll add to that, like even, even today, if you talk to uh, quite a few older African Americans, you'll hear similar concerns that, you know, we're glad the schools are equal now, but we're not, we're not sure how this desegregation has worked <laughs> out for us. I wonder if there's something about just getting older that makes you have that opinion. <laughs> <laughs> because certainly in the 1950s, the young intellectuals at the time, of, um, liberals of both races, were very, very excited <laughs> about integration. And so my guess is that a lot of the older folks, white or black or any other identity today who now question it, may have supported it in the past. Um, Anna Julia Cooper is just one of the interesting black educators who was skeptical of Brown v. Board in the early 1950s. I think there were two strains of thought that went into that. One was um, the idea that we now have some sociological research backing, which is that black children will be exposed to lower expectations by white educators. And Anna Julia Cooper is someone who kind of predicts this. Um, and she has the wisdom to know this is a problem because recall that earlier in her own life, she was attacked for having high expectations and wanting to send these children to Ivy League schools. So uh, she has um, an informed and an, in some sense prescient concern about that. Um, the second concern is, is really about jobs, um, jobs for black educators. Will black educators lose their jobs? Um, and it, yes. That did happen. Tens of thousands of black teachers in the South uh, were fired or laid off or pushed out of school systems as there were some merger between black and white school boards and um, black and white. These black and white systems came together. Uh, there, were re there were jobs that were excess jobs. And it was almost always black jobs that were lost. So these, these concerns were certainly you know, legitimate ones. And that's actually something that comes up I've noticed when you talk to um, Southern politicians about tenure and the importance of tenure, it's one of the things that I've heard more than once people say, mm -hmm. look, like uh, those women, because they were mostly women, didn't have tenure and they just got fired en masse by you know, white administrators and there was no one to protect them. Mm -hmm. and That's that interesting. Actually, a lot of the Southern states did have tenure previous to Brown v. Board mm -hmm. and then when Brown v. Board came onto the horizon in the years just before, they changed their tenure laws. Right. And why were they doing this? They were specifically doing this so they could fire black teachers right. in the event that integration happened. And they foresaw this and were quite deliberate about this. Um, uh, a little more about, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts a little more, and you've written in your own sort of broader writing um, about women's issues quite a bit in addition to education. Um, you talk in the book about this sort of complicated relationship between the teaching profession and the women's movement. You talk about how Elizabeth Cady Stanton kind of uh, talked down to teachers. She had sort of a, from her position as a woman of privilege within that social context. Um, but then there's this wonderful scene um, uh, uh, where Susan B. Anthony sort of stands up and, and um, talks to male educators about why their low social standing is a result of their association with women who were seen as, as not good for anything except for teaching, so what does that say? Um, but at the end of the book, you do say we need more men in teaching. And so um, your thoughts, and this is kind of a broad question about the relationship between the teaching profession and feminism. Big one, let's see. Um, one of the cleavages in feminist thought of the 19th century, and I have noticed this today, even in everyday conversations with smart women, is whether the feminist in question respected or looked down upon teaching. And I trace this cleavage in chapter two, looking at Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So Susan B. Anthony was herself a teacher for about 10 years in her 20s and early 30s. And she loved the job until she became so stuck because women were not allowed to ascend to be principals. And she saw a 19-year-old boy promoted above her as the principal of the school where she was working when she was about 29. And she, this, basically she couldn't continue doing it after this. She was so frustrated and it was, it was one of the big 
um, motivators for her to become a feminist activist. So when she thought about women teachers and about how to improve education, she talked about equalizing pay between men and women, to make the job more respected, getting women into co-ed colleges to train for this career, as opposed to in these crappy normal schools that took people from the sixth and the seventh grade as an alternative to high school and turned them into teachers. So she saw this system, which was based, as we discussed earlier, on the idea that we needed to pay teachers very little. And she saw that as the, the crux of why teaching was not a respected job. And she thought, for women and for students, you had to address all these economic structural issues. Um, now, she was the daughter of a mill owner whose business went bust, and she had an experience of class downward mobility. <laughs> so she was very attuned to economic issues. And in addition, she had a disgust for marriage her entire life from her teen years. She never wanted to get married, so she had to be economically and financially independent. So you can see how her personal experience shaped how she thought about education and teaching. Elizabeth Cady Stannon, the daughter of a judge, the wife of an attorney, seven children who were homeschooled by a governess. She saw public school teaching as this crap work. And she went around the country telling parents, mothers and fathers, do not let your daughters become teachers. Push for your daughters to become doctors. Push for them to become suffrage activists. Push for them to become attorneys. Anything but teaching. What I saw in Stanton was that she had bought into this rhetoric that the previous generation, Catherine Beecher and Horace Mann, had built. They had sent this message that teaching was mothering. It was just like being a mother. Women were biologically predisposed to do it. You didn't necessarily need a very high level of training to do this job. And so Elizabeth Cady Stanton really felt this. So often we talk about second wave feminism of the 60s and 70s as this force that decimated the teaching profession by taking ambitious women out of the classroom. I, I trace in the book the trend line back much, much earlier, over 100 years earlier to the 19th century, because you see ambitious women, even if they're attracted to teaching, you see them infected by these ideas that it's not a respectable job so much earlier. Um, so one of the questions I always get is, did second wave feminism ruin teaching? Is it so hard, you know, because women now can become journalists, doctors, lawyers, is that, you know, why we have this crisis in education? And what I say is, if you look at the numbers, there doesn't seem to be a big drop off in teacher quality pre and post feminism. It looks like about 10% of teachers, both before and after, were graduates of selective colleges with high GPAs, high SAT scores, and all those other at least countable um, measures of eliteness. At the same time, I did a lot of oral histories for the book. There's no question that you talk to women who entered the profession in the late 50s, early 60s, right before the opening up of all these other opportunities to women. They have a level of ambition, some of them, that makes you question if they would have done something else. Um, Joan Wofford is someone who I write about in chapter six. She was one of the founders of the idea that became the National Teacher Corps, which was President Johnson's Great Society program. This is someone who I have no doubt would have been a Supreme Court clerk or something like that. Um, and in fact, she only taught for a few years, and when more opportunities opened up, uh, she was sort of climbing all sorts of ladders later in her life. So um, the, the relationship between feminism and teaching is a complex one. The teachers' union movement is a feminist movement. It was 97% female. Um, there's a lot of very fertile and wonderful back and forth, but there's also a current of feminist thinking that has denigrated teaching, because if it's the only job women are supposed to do, well, then it must be crappy. We have to fight for more. Um, one of the things that I, I find interesting, a little, I guess, funny is maybe the word I'd use, is the extent to which um, ideas like Teach for America, these sort of teacher cores, we're going to go out to disadvantaged schools, we're going to send our most capable people, and they're going to improve them, um, exist pretty much for the, entire of the, in the entirety of the history of teaching. Um, and in, in every case, it's sort of lots of energy, a realization that, in fact, no, that's not going to happen. And then the cycle restarts itself. Yeah. Um, and so you know, what, what do you see happening with our current cycle? Do you think there's more 
we have more context about what's going on, what's happened before, and this maybe we can chart a, a different path, or are we gonna, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, embark upon another one of these things with another, you know, sort of fancy name, educators <laughs> for the future or something. Yeah. That's good. So, <laughs> the missionary teacher figure has been, um, it, it, it is one of the most constant trends that I trace in this book. Uh, going back to the early 19th century, it's uh, the idea that the most elite people can be recruited to teach, but you can only expect them to do it for a short period of time. Um, I've written recently quite a bit about Teach for America. They have begun to truly question some of their own thinking on this, encouraging recruits to consider three, four, five years in the classroom as opposed to just two, launching a pilot program to give folks a full year of pre-service training as opposed to just the five weeks, which is standard for them. I think we have new research now showing the impact of teacher turnover on student achievement. It appears to show, and I talk about this in chapter nine and 10 of the book, it appears to show that even when teacher quality in a school remains constant, so there's no drop off in quality, the churn and burn cycle impacts kids negatively. Even if your own teacher is veteran. So it's interesting, it's like when a lot of adults are turning over in a school, the, the effects kind of seep through classroom walls and find the kids. And it's not surprising because the adult energy in the building is then focused on recruitment, training, and hiring, and less on instruction, improving what's going on in the classroom, and, and this impacts children. So you know, in my writing about Teach for America, I've suggested perhaps that because they are such a central organization in the reform movement, the fact that maybe they are thinking more deeply about their model and experimenting with new ways to train their teachers better and to ask their teachers to stay longer, will this have an overall effect on our policy conversation in terms of acknowledging that retention is as big a part of the conversation as recruitment? Um, we haven't been there in the past decade, but are we headed toward a place like that? I don't know. A lot of people have asked me, like, why don't policymakers learn from history? It's been one of the most. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one of the most common questions I've been getting on this book tour, and I don't like. I don't know. That's like above my pay grade. I think. <laughs> I think we have an ahistoric political conversation in the United States. I think we live in an anti-intellectual country. And you even sometimes, I even heard, some of the critiques I heard of the book is like, well, so much of it's based in the past. I was like, well, it is a history. <laughs> like, if you don't, but I do take it all, I, this, there's reporting in here from six months ago. I mean, I was knocking down my publisher's door to get in some of the stuff that has happened more recently, for example, with Teach for America that I just mentioned. But um, if we don't care to learn the lessons from the past, we will repeat the same mistakes over and over again. And, and am I hopeful and optimistic? I think we're in a hopeful moment right this second because there's a sense that the very strong push on standardized testing absent a stronger instructional vision, there's a sense that that has jumped the shark a bit. And that we need to, no matter how we feel about testing, folks are saying like, let's think more about the instructional component and where do classroom observations fit into all of this? And New America has led the way on some of this questioning. And I think that while we're in this moment now, maybe something else will come up. Um, and I hope that it will be teachers learning from each other, teacher to teacher, which is where I end the book um, in terms of what I think is very, very, very powerful. And I've seen it be powerful in my reporting. Um, but some of these American impulses, this um, obsession with youth and enthusiasm, uh, this is way beyond the education debate. I mean, these are things in our culture that are so deep-seated that I would not be surprised if they come up again and again. Yeah. It, you know, it seems like some of these things are reactions to some of the things that come up again and again are somewhat logical. I don't know if I would in some cases indefensible, in some cases maybe not, um, to just some of the basic sort of structural realities of a very large geographically dispersed nation with no contemplation of education in our federal constitution at all. Um, so we, we started there, and then we made some early decisions um, around 
uh, the role of women and training, and we've never changed any of those things. And so that kind of leads us to certain places where people say, well, if we can't fix those things, because what are we going to do? Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do this. There's, there's also the interesting thing that you kind of trace through there about how um, measurement is always, we have this sort of, like I, I, I did not realize the extent to which the Horace Mann's enthusiasm for, for phrenology was not something that I, I think I had heard about it, a few, but it was really kind of front and center that, that somebody who is, you know, really like lionized in the popular history of American education for, um, you know, starting something, an idea that, that there are a few people in history who, who um, start an idea that was new at the time and 170 years later, almost everyone believes in, and that's this idea of public education. And yet, he thought that it was, we should do that after we measured the bumps in the back of people's heads, and you know, <laughs> then it was IQ testing. Like and you can yeah. measure the bumps, and then with education, you can sort of help you know, yeah. sort the kids. Well, right, that was, that was explicitly the idea, right? And then we just, you know, we, we traded in the bumps for an IQ test, which would do the same thing, essentially, right. just by looking inside the skull, but, with, but frankly, with no more you know, ultimate science behind them. Um, yeah, so along with uh, the missionary teacher ideal, the, the sort of proto-teach for Americas that Jamel asked, the, the testing push is the other one that I would have mentioned as the two uh, most constant themes in American education history. From phrenology to IQ to achievement testing, I want to be careful, you know, today's achievement testing has so much more validity than either of those two <laughs> things that, that are just discussed. And phrenology and IQ were used to classify children Achievement testing today, we're using mostly to classify schools and teachers. So this is, this is a, big, a big change and a positive one. We're no longer so obsessed with um, tracking and classifying kids as we are with um, drawing conclusions about the schools and holding the schools accountable, which I mean overall has been a positive change, although there are certainly excesses to this, which I discuss in chapter nine of the book. Um, Okay, yes. Um, the system, the big, big system. In the first paragraph of this book and the second paragraph of this book, I have to state in both those places that education is not in the U.S. Constitution. It is a responsibility left to states and local governments, and only 13% of the funding comes from Washington. And so what this means is that even though we have a national reform conversation in which ideas for educational improvement are introduced by politicians and philanthropists, whether it's Arnie Duncan or Bill Gates, or they have all the same ideas, so you could say both of them together. Um, these ideas are introduced at the national level and are supposed to trickle down, but actually it is an incredibly localized, quirky, weird system where everything is different from everything else compared, you know, depending on geography. So again, this is why, and like, I am a lifelong um, liberal who tends to think like national government, good, you know, that, that's my bias. So I was surprised when I came out with the conclusion of the book, bottom up, not top down. And I, bottom up change, not top down change. And I think the reason why I came there is just from a pragmatic realization that we're not gonna have a national curriculum in the United States. You know, we went, Kevin and I went to Finland together. And yes, they have a lot of flexibility at the school level, but they also have like a research backed national curriculum that is, you know, handed to the schools to, to experiment with in many ways, but, you know, the Common Core is not that. It just isn't that. It's, it's, it doesn't have the same level of coherence um, that we see in other nations that we compare ourselves to. So this, this idea of top-down reform, we actually lack the political structures to do it in many ways, and, and that's why looking at schools as systems, the school itself is the system, and the teachers collaborating with one another within the school, you know, that's very important. There was, in your um, chapter that's focused on the um, rise of the New York City present-day unionism and the Ocean Hill-Brownsville crisis um, event, uh, there's this sort of fascinating postscript, almost, where you say, oh, and also, there was this huge teacher strike in Newark. Um, that, that is not, doesn't loom nearly as l large in our collective memory, but was actually much more violent and much more prolonged. And, and it made me want to like, read a whole article just about that. Um, well, tell me about some of the things that you came upon in writing the book that you wish you had had time to write more about. Yeah. Well, you can read a whole book about the New York teacher strikes. Um, it's by Steve Golan. It's called 
hope on the line, hopes on the line, I believe. It is fabulous if you have time to read about Newark in the 1970s, which of course was coming out of these horrible um, race turmoil, riots and violence in the streets. All of this leads directly into the teacher strike. It's a moment when black power is confronting the teachers union movement in a much more violent way than it did in the Brooklyn strike, which is so much more famous. Um, so yeah, that's, I actually had originally meant to write more about it. And what I heard was like, everybody wants to hear about New York City. So unfortunately, that was one thing. That was one thing like that. Um, other things that were on the cutting room floor. I am really interested in the history of integration, desegregation. I, this is a book about teachers and teaching and debates over teaching and, and not every broad education debate. So for example, the Boston busing wars, they are not in this book. I reference them briefly in the sense that Mayor John Lindsay in New York City was so scared that something like that would happen in New York that he did not try, really try to desegregate the schools. So you know, one of the things I've been saying in New York City at my um, you know, events up there is like, New York City, hello, you have the most segregated schools in the nation. We never integrated these schools. And lifelong New Yorkers are saying, oh, I never knew that. So it's interesting. That history doesn't get talked about um, as much as it should. And, and I always welcome the opportunity to discuss that. And then the third thing is something that someone here was asking me about right before the event, which is this idea of a new or revitalized vocational education, something that's very interesting to me. Not old style voc ed where you track people and all the poor kids are going to mechanic class and they don't get the opportunity to go to college. But based on the research we have, showing that high school dropouts often say, I thought there was no connection to work and what I was doing and I never saw how this would increase my earning potential. Giving kids the opportunity to go into professional internships and externships and to learn in the workplace. And this, there's a wonderful book called Schooling in the Workplace by a woman named Nancy Hoffman that I'd recommend on that. And I talk very briefly in the epilogue about the linked learning model. Um, that's based out in California. I think that one is very promising. Um, I mean, since you, you want to talk more about integration, um, yeah. might as well. Uh, I mean, one of the things that is striking about um, and I mean, this gets to sort of the problem of scale in the United States in education is that um, you know, most black kids are attending schools that are mostly black and most Latino kids are attending schools that are mostly minority and that, they're, they're these, that there's a tremendous amount of segregation in the American education system that I think kind of just com goes completely unmentioned. Um, and it's, it seems to be something that we have to actually address um, if we're talking about sort of systemic education education reform, yeah, I agree completely, and it's one of the you know rec one of the ten recommendations I make for opening up this debate. Like, let's burst this debate open. Let's you know not just talk about value added measurement of teachers, but all this other stuff, which is so important. And um, integrated schools is one of them. You know, I think that the the most politically fruitful way to discuss this today is a choice based model. So it is good that the Obama administration had passed a regulation in the past year that allows charter schools to weigh their lotteries to achieve socioeconomic diversity. Originally, the No Excuses Charter School movement was very interested in this concept of 999, 90% failing test scores, 90% low income, 90% children of color. Well, in chapter eight, I discussed the research on integration, and we know that there's very positive academic achievement effects for poor children when they get to attend schools that are not overwhelmed by poverty, but where they're also with middle class and affluent kids. And guess what? There are not negative effects on the middle class and affluent kids who might even learn something about people other than themselves and also have a positive experience. I was best, so I speak from personal experience on this one. Um, you know, you look at Montgomery County and the interesting research that the Century Foundation has done where it was through public housing lotteries that they achieved school integration. So it's not just educa education policy that we have to look at, but also housing policy. So through the mix of charter schools, magnet schools, and with urban planning thought, <laughs> we, can, we can achieve this. And it is not the old 70s debates about busing. And it is not fair to sort of tar the conversation about desegregation or integration with old idea. Um, and there's a great book out right now from Rick Collenberg 
Um, and you may have seen an op-ed in the New York Times that's talking about the smarter charter. And he's very interested in the idea of charters as a desegregation tool. Right. And there's an interesting movement within the charter schools movement to do this, whether you're talking about community roots in Brooklyn, the Larchmont schools in LA, the Charles Drew School in Atlanta. So you see these hopeful spots um, across the country. Um, and I think, that, I think that that is very positive and very important. And uh, we often talk about teacher effectiveness policy as what took the place of a failed debate about racial integration. Actually, we did not implement racial integration. Right. And where we did implement it, we saw 3.5.8 percentage point gains for kids. Guess what? Those are the same small but significant percent gains that we're seeing from the accountability policies that are most successful. So why not the two together? It's always a conversation of, well, this failed. We didn't even really try it, but let's just say that it failed. Toss it out. Go to the next thing very little coherence at the policy level. So, you know, these ideas could be fruitful in tandem, not set up in competition with one another. There is, I mean, some, not some, uh, quite a bit of tension between some of the more promising ideas that are by their nature top down. I mean, desegregation feels pretty top down to me <laughs> in many ways. It was imposed by the, I mean, from the legal level, it was imposed by the Supreme Court. Um, it requires us, you know, often to look across um, traditional communities and, and uh, legal boundaries which have organized themselves for a lot of reasons, some of which, you know, very much pernicious policy reasons um, in, a, in a segregated fashion. Um, I mean, that does seem different than just coming from the ground up. I mean, I, like I was, I was struck by the quote in your um, Ocean Hill Brownsville chapter, which, you know, again, I think is very, very nuanced and fair. I mean, in, in a way that I think, I mean, it was clear to me you took like a lot of pains to really understand exactly what was going on. Um, and at the end of it, um, and, and you know, like I don't think that the conventional thought has treated the uh, community all that well in that discussion. I don't think that it's really 50-50 in terms of who thinks who was right and who was wrong. Um, and, and you acknowledge that it seemed that the whole crisis, and this is almost, I think, unavoidable, seem to have a very bad academic effect on the students. And you know, parsing sort of the nature of the education with helicopters and uh, you know, the, the level of animus that kind of came in there I think would be almost impossible. But there's this quote from the principal where he says, um, well, yeah, you know, everyone else had failed and so we felt like at least we could fail on our own. I mean, it's poignant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But at the same time, everyone wants more than failure. And so, um, I yeah. mean, is it, the Common Core, which a lot of people have enthusiasm for, including educators, is you know, it's pretty top down in many ways. I mean, top down mm -hmm. from philanthropy, arguably, uh, more than any place. And so, so it, I mean, given that our system has fallen short in many ways and has been primarily decentralized, I mean, can we? How likely is it that sort of just relying on the grassroots to grow will work? I think it has to be a combination of up and down. Mm. I actually like the Common Core. I've, I've written about the standards quite a bit, and I've read them, and I, I think that they're good standards. Um, the trouble with them is in the implementation, the lack of resources to skills build for teachers, and that's where I think the teacher-to-teacher -teacher learning and sharing of best practices is going to be really important. One of the currencies in the system that doesn't get talked about enough is time, because the way the teacher's workday is structured uh, there's not enough time for adults to work with other adults on something like getting something like the Common Core right. And that's something you hear from teachers a lot, and I think it's an important point to make. And of course, time is money. Anytime you have adults with other adults, they're not in front of kids, and someone else has got to be with the kids. So that's, that's just something to think about. Um, the things that are supposed to be so affordable, when they're done right, become more expensive. So the idea that um, it's not about the money, which you hear a lot about in school reform, I try to you know, complicate question that a little bit because we want reforms to be done correctly and not just fast and cheap. Um, so yes, I think, I think when you talk about something like a charter school that through its attractive curriculum and effective disciplinary practices is going to be attractive to parents from across racial and socioeconomic lines, that is integration on a choice model. So it's really different from the sort of top-down um, busing-based integration that we saw in the 60s and 70s. So 
I, I think realistically, and of course I think this is a good thing intellectually, we're going to continue to have ideas for school reform that are top down ideas. Um, the, implement, the, the implementation, though, must come from an acknowledgement of what the system looks like on the ground. And there needs to be flexibility in the implementation, and there needs to be you know, tr training and sharing of practices on the ground that is encouraged and not quashed. I mean, that's one of the things that I look at in Chapter 10 of the book. You see teachers organizing around the Common Core at Crenshaw High School in Los Angeles. Common core based curriculum, but it's very based on sort of community service and community activism as its organizing theme. And uh, parents and kids and all sorts of people are excited about this at Crenshaw High School. And the superintendent of Los Angeles doesn't like it because it's not his vision of what common core school reform looks like. And the next thing you know it, the vast majority of the teachers who've been active in this effort have been recessed, they're getting moved around to other schools, and the experiment is over. So currently, what you see in our current system is that when teachers organize and empower themselves to try a new idea, too often they're stomped on, not empowered. Um, I want to give Jamel one more chance to ask any last questions you have, and then we'll go to uh, questions from the audience. I, I hope we just go to questions from the audience. OK. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Do we have a, a microphone, or are we just? Uh, yes, so we have a microphone. Um, I will call on you, and then um, wait for the microphone to come. Uh, sir, in the front. Uh, all the way up in the front, please. Thanks. Uh, my name's Dave Price, and I'm just someone who spent 33 years. Is it on? I think it's on. Yeah. Is it? No? no. I don't think so. We've got the light. We can hear you okay, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, I mean you, I'm you a teacher voice, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who spent 33 years and still spending time in education, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your book. I thank haven't completed you. it. But uh, one of the schools that I work at happens to be Dunbar, which you, which you mentioned. Um, but I want to set up a hypothetical for you. You have your 10 recommendations in the back. But uh, tonight you're riding home, your cell phone rings, and it's Barack Obama. <laughs> and he says, I've read your book, but I you can't do 10 things. Oh, God. I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I just, like, I'm just, I don't want to do from your book, give him two or three. Where, I mean, it's so massive. You've done, you know, a you know. We're, and this will help for our, our audience on the web, too. This is oh, I know right. uh, So my question is, uh, what would be your top two or three recommendations in some kind of, and I know it's a difficult question, mm -hmm. I understand that, and, yeah. but, or just pick you know, something that you think, bang for your buck, whatever, however you want to organize it. What would you do first? Because it has to be a first thing first. I think my overall, my overall large idea, which informs a lot of the 10 things in the back of the book, is that classroom level instruction matters. So the teacher actions and behaviors in, in the class are the, are the stuff of education. So with every idea we have, we have to make sure that we're improving those interactions between student and teacher. Um, I did a piece for the Wall Street Journal on, on four research-driven teacher behaviors that seem to work to improve student achievement. I would like politicians to read that because <laughs> when you realize that drilling kids on multiple choice tests leads to depressed student achievement, that having conceptual, deeper intellectual questions at the heart of the lesson is what leads to the higher test scores that we all say we want, you know, then you start to ask the question about is the way that we're implementing the Common Core going to lead to these outcomes? Is it going to lead to the conceptual lessons we know only a third of the classrooms now are conceptually driven and not fact driven, you know, right or wrong? So that's my over. I'm, I'm going to leave it there because it's a tough question, but it's the, the stuff of education is the interaction between the student and the teacher. Just real quickly, would you give up your book tour? You're writing and come with me as I talk to superintendents <laughs> uh, and uh, around the country. Uh, you won't make as much money, but we could have fun. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not making that much money, but. <laughs> wouldn't make any. <laughs> um, yes, in the back. OK, hi, my name is Steve Wojcikiewicz, and I uh, do teacher prep policy for the AFT. Uh, my question is about your emphasis on bottom-up reform. Um, I think your common core examples are very striking. I'm curious how you see all the pieces moving at once, in the sense that for policymakers to say teachers need the time and support 
to implement these reforms, it seemed you have to have a certain respect for the professionalism of teachers and the job of teaching. But how do you build that respect by giving teachers the time to work on it, to, you know, the time and support? So it's like you have to have the attitude in order to get the funding, but you have to have the funding in order to let the teachers do the work. How do you move that whole picture at once so you're providing policy solutions and changing attitudes? That's tough, but one of the things I try to do in the chapter 10 of my book is to show great teachers at work in the classroom and to, to depict a little bit what that actually looks like. Because once we realize that of the 3.4 million teachers we already have working, I mean, this should be obvious, but many of them are very good at what they do. <laughs> and we can look to them to, to show examples of what great teaching looks like. Then I think what I write in the book is that we want our policy debate to be motivated less by fear of the worst teachers than by the inspiration we draw from the best. So when you know, when I see President Obama standing up in the State of the Union saying, let's stop making excuses for bad teachers. Oh, yeah, and by the way, great teachers are great. Like, let's just put some more specifics <laughs> behind that second part of that, which is, you know, what does great teaching look like? So what I say as a journalist is when I'm talking to administrators or unions, let me come see your best work because that should be the model. Um, I don't... I, I wish that in our national conversation we would look more at the work of the best teachers. I mean, I'm a journalist, so some of these big policy level questions I struggle with, but it's, you make a very important point. It's, it's hard to make change without the respect there. Uh, sir, right here. Yeah, my name is Randy Scarborough. I taught at a small high school in Southern California for 31 years. Uh, recently, a federal judge went after tenure uh, in my state, and when the decision came down and Arne Duncan made a comment, you could almost hear the champagne corks popping in the background. Uh, my question is, when did we lose the Democratic Party? <laughs> Barack Obama has been cozying up with charter school people for 10 years. Arne Duncan is no friend of public education. Cory Booker, when did we more or less lose the Democratic Party at, the, at its top levels? Mm -hmm. Well, the debate in the Democratic Party about teachers unions is like 100 years old. So Jane Addams, the settlement house crusader in Chicago, wanted stricter teacher accountability measures. And Margaret Haley, the founder of the teachers union movement, opposed that. And then President Johnson created the National Teacher Corps over the objections of the NEA. So even our you know, war on poverty president had some beef with the teachers unions. Um, I think that the, the, the black power critique of union teachers infiltrated the left, including the mainstream of the Democratic Party. I mean, when you see um, a, gen a generation of Generation X Democrats, Cory Booker, Barack Obama, um, they, a lot of them, they have personal ties to organizations like Teach for America and the KIPP Charter School Network. They actually personally know folks that were involved in the leadership of those organizations. And so they're sympathetic and excited by it. And though the ideology of those organizations was crafted to suit the Reagan years, the idea of small government, the idea of philanthropically, not federally supported change models. So I think now we see as Generation X or the, the younger baby boomers like President Obama, as they ascend politically, there's this debate in the Democratic Party, but there's nothing new about debates in the Democratic Party about teachers and unions and to what extent being a, a pro-public education Democrat means being a pro-union Democrat. I mean, I think, of course, the folks you mentioned would dispute your characterization and say that they are pro-public schools. They just have a critique of the union position. Right, I, I, would, I would add to that yeah. that, you know, guys like Barack Obama and Cory Booker and, and folks um, in the Democratic Party in this mold are coming, are, are they're urban Democrats first, yeah. first and foremost. I don't mean that as a euphemism for African American, I mean that they're centered in cities. 
Um, and that's going to just inform how they approach education policy. I'm sure that if the national democratic leadership came from North Carolina and Southern Virginia and South Carolina, they might have a very different view of teacher unionization and teachers unions and sort of teacher organization just because those are, that's a different context for um, teaching and for its intersection with politics. You, you make a, uh, an interesting observation or you quote someone making an observation about the sort of symbiotic relationship between teachers unions once they became agents of collective bargaining and large administrative organizations because um, that's a position of greater leverage for them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of historians of labor have made the point, and I'm just borrowing this, that unionism is essentially a conservative force. What do we mean by that? We know unions advocate for progressive policies. They ally themselves to management because it is, a union wants to sit down from an empowered management across the table that is empowered to agree to their demands. In education, what this means is that, you know, in the 60s and 70s, as demands for community control of urban schools grew up, teachers unions did not want that, not because they hated parents, but because, you know, in New York City, there's one million kids in, you know, countless schools. Are they going to sit down and debate a contract with every single principal? That's not what they want. They want to go to a school board, they want to go to a mayor, and they want to sit down at the city level and, and debate a contract that is going to apply to all 80,000 of their members. And so, you know, um, historians of teachers unions have made this point that from the parents' perspective, it has often seemed like there's no difference between the union and the administration of these urban systems that has pursued all these nefarious policies like refusing to desegregate the schools and, and cutting funding because they see them all as part of one bureaucracy. Um, and, you know, reformers the past 10, 20 years have called this the blob. And I, you know, I think it's important that within the blob there's lots of different interests. But there's some, you know, there's some accuracy to that characterization. Um, uh, right here. Yeah, please, please. Um, my name's Helena, and my mom's a teacher. And we have these conversations all the time about education. And I was wondering, you talk a lot about the teachers and the impact they have, or the impact that this, these policies have, but what about like the actual student? Like I just graduated from college and before that I was in high school and I found because of the standardized test as you mentioned, students constantly are now worried more about like, oh, how am I gonna get an A? How am I gonna ace this test? Not necessarily about like intellectual curiosity and like expanding this. And um, my high school English teacher who really like challenged me critically and like where a a was like such a huge achievement from her. And she and I have talked about this too, so I'm wondering what all of your perspectives are in terms of the impact you see on, that teachers have said they have seen on students on the college level or even high school level. Sorry, that was like a really long-winded question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the standardized testing push impacts kids in schools where they have interpreted this to mean we should spend a lot of time prepping for multiple choice tests. And so I look you know, in chapter nine of the book at a district in Colorado where they decided to create tests in gym and art and music. And then as a result, kindergartners and first graders were coming in and sitting down, taking a multiple choice test. This is admittedly an extreme example, but you'd be surprised. The state of Florida is now saying they're going to test in every subject, every grade level. So it's not as, um, it's not as surprising as you might think. And, and you're right, it does have an impact on students. There is a proper use of testing in the classroom. The proper use of testing is to diagnose what the students do and do not know so that the teacher can direct his or her instruction effectively toward the students. And you would use diagnostic testing in the beginning of a unit. And then again, you test at the end and you see if you have successfully taught. And the teacher is doing this to help the kids, not because he or she is necessarily subject to a whole bunch of accountability measures. I mean, that's my take <laughs> on a functional use of testing that is driven by the research I've done from this book on how testing impacts kids. I think even, even Bill Gates told you this Florida thing was crazy. Yeah, so when I had the opportunity, actually I had the opportunity to ask um, both Arnie Duncan and Bill Gates about what they thought of Florida. And they were both like, <gasps> Oh, we don't like, that's what they're doing. We don't like that. Um, and that's what you see behind Arne Duncan's statement of a couple weeks ago that 
the standardized testing push is, you know, sucking the oxygen out of the room, quote unquote. You know, I think there's this sense that we need to examine the excesses of accountability, that we started out with too little accountability, but have we pushed too much too fast? And I, I, think, I think this gets a bit to what you were saying earlier about sort of the need for kind of a full spectrum approach to these things. You know, we teach training, accountability, everything. Um, some, some, to some degree, the insane push for testing in some places reads like an attempt to avoid durable policy and go for a quick fix. And so I think, you know, a, a reconfiguration towards more durable, full spectrum policy in terms of improving schools and improving teachers will address some of these, you know, these extreme cases. Thank you. Um, I feel like in the book and in your other writing, you talk about, um, you know, the fact that our public education system exists in a context of a somewhat weak, you know, social services in this country. So I feel like the book in some places is grappling with this idea of, um, you know, we don't want to teach, treat teachers like like extraordinary angels, like they're doing some sort of community service, like it's a job, like we should respect people who do it well, but, and I agree with that, like I don't want it to be like, oh my God, you're a hero, <laughs> you know, which, but, but I feel like some teachers are in the face of the fact that, you know, in schools that are 90% poverty, they're being tasked to be a social worker and a teacher and a, you know, and, and, and. So, I mean, how can we both not have this sort of angel devil dichotomy and recognize the, the sort of double duty that maybe teachers in high poverty schools are doing? Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, one of my own early memories of my, from my own education is my fourth grade teacher buying a winter coat for a boy in my class. And like, to me, she was a hero in that moment. So I don't, yes, I want to acknowledge that teachers are stepping up to the plate <laughs> in their non-academic responsibilities for their kids every single day. Um, I talk about the research on teachers' impact and poverty in the book so that we can demystify this. 7% um, of the current achievement gap is driven by teacher quality gaps between schools, 7%. The vast majority of it is coming from family, socioeconomic factors, and neighborhoods. However, the same research suggests that if the best teachers were systematically moved to the poorest kids, more than half of these achievement gaps that are you know, socioeconomically based could be closed. So my question is then, well, how are we doing at systematically moving the best teachers to the neediest kids? And the answer is not great. We see that in the highest poverty schools, there's a constant you know, churn and burn, which itself impacts achievement, as I was discussing earlier. We see that only about 25% of the teachers last year who in a federal experiment were offered $20,000 to go to a higher poverty school, only 25% wanted to even apply to potentially get the, this bonus, which is a giant bonus in the world of public education. So that brings me you know, to what Jamal was just talking about and what I mentioned earlier of the broader, let's broaden the conversation because you know, a tool like integration so that there aren't so many 100% high poverty schools will mean that teachers can do more effective work without having to be heroes for 25 kids in the class. Maybe they can be heroes for three kids. <laughs> Maybe three kids need heroics and, you know, 22 of them need a really great instructional leader in front of the class. And maybe that's a balance that's much more um, doable. So, so yes, I, I like what you said a lot. <laughs> it seems like I mean, heroism is something that almost by definition is a good that we greatly value but cannot reasonably expect from someone. I mean, yeah. I think that's what heroism means. I mean, it's, and it's so like, to, you can't build a, a system of expectations around what yeah. we can expect from people. I mean, I look at the book of what we can learn from systems abroad, and I think it's important to put things in an international mm -hmm. context. But in a way, I just get frustrated with this debate. It's like Japan, South Korea, Finland, well, we have a, you know 20% of the kids in poverty here. So it's not going to look like these other countries, not as long as we have these child poverty rates. 
So that is a, like a very important kind of underlying conversation. And yet at the same time, I completely reject the idea that because of poverty, we should not improve schools. And we can't talk about instruction. And, and that's, to me, just too easy. You know? and, and I wouldn't have become an education journalist if I thought that we shouldn't talk about education until we're done with poverty. You know, that I wouldn't be doing this job if I felt that that was a legitimate argument. Um, the gentleman in the back, standing up. Thank you. So one of the things that you talked about, um, one of the variables was time, and to me another variable is trust. And so I'm curious to see how you would create more trust. And part of my discussion or thinking of that is, you talked about the power of teacher to teacher and sort of the personal learning communities, and that requires a lot of trust and people willing to see each other and willing to talk to each other and willing to acknowledge that one, you know, there could be improvements. So how would you create a system where you could have that trust? And then a sub to that is, do you think that some of the laws and unions right now where a teacher isn't allowed to observe another teacher yeah. prevent that type of trust? <clears throat> um, yeah, so unions have Unions, unfortunately, have often not been helpful in negotiations on adult-to-adult -adult time in the system, and that, I think, is changing now. Um, we've seen some changes in New York, which is the system I'm most familiar with. I live in New York. But uh, we've seen some systems changes even in the past year where there's going to be more collaborative time built into the day, something that the, the unions had previously opposed. So yes. Um, I've, I write a little bit in the book about the role of the principal and how crucial that is because when you ask people, why does this high poverty school have teachers that are dying to work in it? And this one, nobody wants to work in it. <laughs> and they're five blocks away from each other and, and the demographics are really similar. It's always the principal. The principal is 100% of the time the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, and we don't often talk about the principal, but the principal is often where good school reforms go to die. Um, one of the interesting things in the history is um, I trace this attempt to have better classroom observations and really look at what teachers are doing student to teacher in the classroom. And it's often the principal who's either unwilling or unable to go into the classroom and in a detailed way look at what the teacher is doing, either because they don't have the time, they're drowning under the responsibilities of you know, running every aspect of a school, or they just don't have the skill and the training to do a good job. So you know. We've had a teacher accountability, teacher effectiveness conversation. You know, we, we need to, you know, principal accountability, principal effectiveness. That's also quite important. And it, it builds trust. Um, yes. I have a teacher voice, too. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. So I respect that yeah. very much. <laughs> it's a good thing you got a microphone. Yeah. Um, I spent most of my adult life as a classroom teacher, proudly. Um, although it was very interesting how many times people in, in at, I don't know, cocktail parties or whatever, once I said I was a teacher, that was the end of the conversation, <laughs> um, as if I didn't have anything else to say. Um, but one of the things that's been really clear to me, and I don't hear it talked about very much, is there aren't just, there isn't just one kind of great teacher and there isn't just one kind of great school. And I wonder what you have to say about, I mean, you could be a great teacher for a single kid or for this kind of kid or what have you. And, um, and I think that's part of the anti-charter movement is a sort of a fear of diversity. What do you think that's coming from, that, that sense that we could only have one model of good teacher or great teacher and one model of, of great school? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, in the epilogue of the book, I talk about an idea introduced by the political scientist Stephen Tellis and the sociologist John Mega. They're at Johns Hopkins and Harvard, and they talk about communities of practice. So the idea that we know that um, schools that have a certain pedagogical strategy that work for their particular student population are successful, they could partner with a teacher's college that also adopts a similar set of tools, and then we could have 
a more coherent system, but there needs to be like 10 of those models. <laughs> there can't, it can't be just no excuses, for example. No excuses has shown some success, in part because it's a coherent way of looking at the work, and the adults who work in those systems have signed on to do that type of work. Um, and to a certain extent, families are choosing that they want to be in a no excuses school, but is there a similar model that could, you know, come up around an art-centric curriculum or a project-based curriculum or yes, 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 yes. So I, I completely agree. It's something I write about a little bit. I think the linked learning system in California, which I mentioned earlier, has had some success uh, organizing itself as a community of practice. And absolutely, the, the system is so diverse and so geographically spread out. You know, what I'm about to go to rural West Virginia and to, to do some schools reporting later this week, and I can guarantee you that what works in Harlem might not work in rural West Virginia, but some of it might, there might be some good sharing there. But you, you know, you have to be open to the idea, um, both that, it, that there are similar things that work for all kids, but also differences. What research have you done? You talked about recruiting and retention. What research have you done on why the best you know, students out of college choose or don't choose or consider teaching, mm -hmm. why people leave? As you think about the different levers of security versus upside versus length of career, what are the drivers that make sense to you as a journalist? Yeah, so there's actually good polling of teachers who've left. And Laura, who's here in the back, has written about this. Uh, she's a teacher who left. <laughs> but uh, teachers say that they often leave because there's no opportunity for advancement. And they don't just mean money, but they mean opportunities to be recognized in the adult world for what they're doing and to have a changing set of responsibilities over time so that their role is not stagnant. So career ladders that build teachers' responsibilities. And one thing I suggest in the book is they should be mentoring novices when they get good. You know, Those sorts of things can be powerful. Uh, teachers who leave also complain about the principals quite a lot, which is one thing I mentioned earlier. I think it's important to have you know, administrators that are focused on empowering teachers. You know, a lot of teachers never receive any feedback, positive or negative. So no one has said to them, like, Kevin, you've been here two years. How do you like it here? Are you thinking of staying? You know, these kinds of things that any good boss in any career should be doing, should you know, be more standard practice um, in schools. Um, why do people choose to teach or not? choose to teach. I mean, I think that the vast majority of teachers are mission driven. And quite a few of them say, like, I have imagined myself as a teacher since being a student. But I do look um, at some of the economic research showing that the gaps between what a teacher can earn in the United States and what other college educated careers pay is bigger here than in other nations. So for example, in South Korea, an engineer and a teacher are at the same salary level. Here we know that they have a big differential between them. And you can look at sort of the attorney-teacher uh, gap <laughs> as another predictive one for teacher quality across the Western world. And actually, it's interesting because we probably all know someone who might have thought about being a teacher or going to law school, <laughs> or in my case, journalist or law school, which is the perennial debate. I'm so glad I avoided that one. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we have asked American teachers to close income inequality gaps, and that is seen as one of their responsibilities. But teachers are a victim of increasing inequality. Teachers earning power relative to other college-educated workers has decreased since 1940. So in 1940, a teacher was about average or a little bit better than other similarly educated people, depending on if you were a man or a woman. Now you are below. So you are seeing your peers um, be able to, to afford more faster. One of the things that's important to look at is to bring some of teachers' raises and compensation forward into a little bit earlier in the career. In North Carolina, it takes 15 years to go from $30,000 entry level salary to $40,000. So, like, we're talking 37 years old. 40, you have just achieved $40,000. And this sets public school teaching apart from other jobs that require a master's degree at the high school level. I mean, you can't, you have to look at the structure of how it's paid. Jamal has written about this too. Um, in front. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. Oh, actually, uh, next after it. Oh, after it. Oh, sorry. Uh, her first. And then, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Stephanie DeLuca, and I'm from the American Chemical Society. Um, I actually have two questions. Does this work? That's not the question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> three questions. <laughs> so um, they might be related. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so the first question is, um, we have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of energy in this room and in the education world, it seems, in general, about we have all these great ideas, we're going to go do this, you know, we're going to have, like, te teacher networking, and they're going to have workforce, you know, um, professional development opportunities and things like that. We're going to make this country, like, the greatest education center ever. But where do you suggest that the funding come from to carry that out, or do you think it's a more reshuffling of the money that's already being um, put forth for education purposes. My second question is um, different. Um, so I went to a rural school in Alabama and my general sense was that the teachers and the educators, there might have been like one or two who seemed to care about the students. Most of the time they cared about Friday's football game. Um, I was wondering, and then, you know, I go and observe my sister. She's in high school now, and it's very similar. Um, I don't know. Do you think it's because schools and rural communities are, like, the teachers and administrators there are the last to know about these ideas that are coming out, or, or they don't care? Do you see if it's a trend across rural versus, say, urban centers? Um, or why do you think that the rural schools tend to be slower on the uptake than some of these other, other places? I think rural systems are slower on the uptake on any reform or change movement because of their geographic isolation. I don't, it's not because people don't care. Um, sports. Sports are a thing that suck up a lot of energy and money in the American public school system that set us apart from our international peers. Amanda Ripley, who is also a fellow at New America, has written about this quite persuasively, and she has looked at how it, unfortunately, may be especially a problem in rural places. So I think what you experienced, um, you know, there's some evidence to back that, and that takes me to your first question, which is, it's going to be more about reshuffling money <laughs> than about more money. And I mean, you just have to look at our political gridlock to see why, that, why that's the case. Sure, yes. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Wyatt Nelson uh, with the AFT. Um, so you mentioned, we were talking earlier about uh, the industrial education system uh, with sort of the factory setting education um, where you know the batch of students comes in and you fill them up with knowledge and then they leave after one year um, and so our economy has changed quite a bit since then so do you envision a new system of education that's not based on the industrial revolution um, and not based on the industrial economy for the 21st century based on your research I don't think we can prepare kids for specific jobs um, the current system was based on the assumption that only about 10% of kids would go to college. Today we want college for all. So we have, we're, we're putting a very high expectation conversation on a system that was not built for that. I think it's much more important to teach kids critical thinking skills and high literacy and numeracy than to direct them toward anything because the economy changes sometimes much faster than we can predict. And we don't always, we aren't always good at predicting what the needs of the economy will be in terms of people's skills. But we know that more education leads to better outcomes for people within the economy. I'm just curious, I'm curious what Kevin and Jamal would say about this one. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would agree. It, it, seems, it seems sort of hard practically to be able to, to, to train kids for particular jobs. Um, and it just seems foolhardy. I mean, if you, you know, if in the 90s you're like, oh, we should have every kid take a visual basic class, and then five years later that's just utterly useless. I mean, it would have been useless at the time. Um, 
but it would have been more useless later on. Uh, you know, it just doesn't seem like it would work. You know, I, I know in my experience, I had the, the, the very good luck to have very good public, public school teachers in simply learning how to think, learning how to read, learning how to look at text. Um, it's been far more beneficial to my life uh, than, you know, learning any particular skill. Although I do appreciate the things I learned in home ec. I think, I mean, the key is that people always have forward access to more educational opportunities. Um, some of those opportunities happen in formal educational settings, which is why we want to make sure that people have, if not college for all, at least all people with a reasonable chance to choose college if, if that's where they want to go. But, you know, a lot of what we learn, we learn um, on the job while working, uh, but only in some jobs. And that, that, I think, is sort of the um, scary thing about the economy we're living in that we're really trying to wrestle with, which is that some jobs and some careers offer like, vast opportunities for learning and personal advancement, and some you're just stuck um, not learning anything. And if you're not learning, you're falling behind. Um, so um, I think you can direct people into certain sorts. You can direct people in certain directions. Going to college is, is, is itself a sort of t type of career choice, although it opens more careers in front of you. Um, what you don't want is to kind of steer people down those blind alleys where it's very hard to kind of reverse and get back into the learning system. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that there's not a role for workplace education in terms of getting to see what it's like to be an adult who's in the workplace, who has goals and sets them and meets them and all these things. I mean, I, I've seen that this in, a, in and of itself can be powerful, especially for kids who aren't being exposed to the workplace and ideas about that at home. So I think it's a kind of a fine line. Um, I think we have time for one more question. We'll take it right here, and then if you want to hang around, we can talk to you. So, yes, please. Thank you very much for this mighty intellectual work. <laughs> I've heard it said teachers take great pains to make something much more simply received to someone else, and that increases civilization. So thank you for teaching us. <laughs> um, I wonder, parents being the primary educators, I'm a teacher, I've been a lifelong teacher, as a sort of secondary educator that plays ideally second fiddle to an engaged family. Obviously, we don't have the ideal in many instances. But I see in the, the United States a need to find professional, um, but not just professional, personas that we can point to to teach the family about education but, uh, but about teaching, about the profession of teaching, about a teacher, what is a teacher, as one of the sort of choice-worthy professional thing that they would hold us to the standard, so they improve the schools by demanding that the teachers live up to it, but also encourage it in their homes to their children so that we have more uh, professional teachers in the next generation. I'm curious in your treasure trove here, who you find are truly the, the great exemplars that we'd want to bring back out, um, the sort of the, the, the one or two that are really great for that, and that would be particularly useful in our current milieu. So you're asking me the one or two greatest teachers in American history? <laughs> <laughs> or, the or the one or two you think models, they could even be fictional, I don't know, what's been used before, the okay. one or two models that would, would help rebirth this image. Gotcha. I like real people more than pretend people. So um, I teach English. I, men I mentioned Anna Julia Cooper, the black feminist teacher who worked here in DC. I would love everyone to know her story. I think she's incredibly inspiring. And, and she was a career teacher from her teenage years until her late 70s. Um, she is a wonderful example. And if you're interested in her, chapter three of the book is your jam. Um, <laughs> And you, you asked for two. <laughs> I didn't realize, but maybe she's my favorite person in the whole book, because nobody's asked me that before. Um, I, I guess I would refer people also to chapter five of the book, which is kind of where Kevin started the conversation. You can read about these crazy, radical, communist teachers. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we adopt their politics, but um, to read about how they didn't have a black history curriculum, so they wrote one themselves. Um, to read about how the bathrooms were dirty in the school, so you know they just decided to fix it. 
Um, and not just to go about themselves to do it, but to partner with families and even ministers in the neighborhood and all of this. I mean, it goes back to what you were asking about, Tanya, about <laughs> so many teachers are taking that extra step, and we should acknowledge that. Um, I find many of their stories, which I tell in Chapter 5, you know, quite interesting and inspiring. And these were also teachers who were very active in an intellectual community that gave them the strength um, to do the work that they were doing. And that, I think, is also very important to think about, is that, you know, when adults are working, they need to, to have colleagues and peers, um, which is, is a theme you've noticed I've come back to again and again, because teachers spend their time with kids, but they are adults that have all the same needs as all other professional adults for collaboration, um, recognition from the adult world, um, and all of those things. So this was a group of teachers that was active mid-century that form this for themselves. And I find that quite fascinating. So that's how I'd answer the question. Um, thanks to all of you for coming. Please join me in thanking Dana and Janelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.